Hi, good evening. Good to see you tonight. Uh, the Lord blessed. He blessed. We could use some rain. We got some rain before door knocking, and it brought the temperature down. And and uh, we had a we had a splendid night. And uh, Stephen and Brooke took one for the team. They didn't, but that's the way it works sometimes, right? Here's what I want you to do. If I if I can ask you to do this, I think the Lord blessed today. And and Stephen may not be right with God, but it's uh, just but. We've never had good success in Fairfield Point visiting. And what we've had is, is a lot what you've had. You've been there before. And that's consistent, isn't it? Tonight, there was tenderness. I beg you, pray for Fairfield Point. Here's what we're going to do on Wednesday nights, and we're going to do some things on Saturdays. We're, by God's grace, I'm asking that God will help us to glean that apartment complex. Children, and we want to teach them the gospel, we want to see these children saved, we want to rescue them. And, and I... The prayers of God's people make a difference. I'm begging you, if you could just think about this. When you pray for Vacation Bible School, that um, I want you to pray that um, the Lord will tenderize and prepare and do some plowing before we go in there. Tonight was different. And I know what you experienced, I'm just, you know, I'm teasing, was what the way it's been. I've been gun-shy going back. Tonight was different. I praise the Lord for it. And it's just His goodness. And so we're excited about that. And so... Um, let me tell you what's going on here. Two weeks from tonight, two weeks from tonight, we'll have Noah Wilkerson. Noah Wilkerson going to Mozambique will be here. Noah Wilkerson will be here two weeks from tonight. Three weeks from tonight, we will not be here. Three weeks from tonight, we'll be up at uh, West Harrison, Indiana for junior camp. Two weeks from tonight, Noah Wilkerson. Three weeks from tonight, we'll be up at junior camp. And um, I'll be preaching, so if that makes you stay away. But... Um, We'll be up at junior camp um, three weeks from tonight, two weeks from tonight, Noah Wilkerson to Mozambique. And um, then, you know, just five weeks from this past Monday, four weeks from this coming Monday, Vacation Bible School. And then we've got um, junior camp coming up 25th to the 29th. So what's that? C. Deb, C. Deb, you know, for registration and all that stuff. So that'll be good for her to kind of be, uh, help us figure out, will we have enough in the shuttle? Do I need to get a trailer for all their luggage? Or will we have enough to fit the luggage in the trailer or in the shuttle? all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm excited. You know, one reason I'm excited. I'm excited. This young man, David, David, David Estrada, David Estrada. I said, are you related to Eric Estrada? How many know Eric Estrada? You know, he never heard of him. Eric Estrada's on this old show called Chips. Yeah. yeah you remember that? Remember that? And he'd never heard of him, but he's only like 23 years old. So I said, oh, I didn't think he would. But um, David, he was just tender from the minute he opened the door. And uh, I said, do you have any children ages 4 to 12? He said, no, but my wife's pregnant. He was all excited about it. And um, he's going to let me have a Bible study with him. Dead serious. And so got, we exchanged. And he did something that's unique. So I'm, I'm pumped. So I'm, I'm excited. You know, I mean, it's, it's good. And um, he said, well, let me go get my phone to make sure that you got the right phone number. And he said, yeah, I got it. And he showed me. You know, that, that makes my day because, you know, I can tell you how many people give me some number that doesn't exist. And, um, but anyway, I, I would love to see this young man. Um, his name's David, his wife's Natalie. And um, I told him, I said, you want to be a great dad? I said, you need to know the God of the Bible. I said, anybody ever taught you the Bible? He goes, no. I said, that's what we do. And uh, I'd love to do that. So um, what a thrill tonight. That's just the goodness of God. And there was some tenderness, but what you experienced, I feel so bad. But I'm, I'm excited, and you're, he took one for the team. It is. When we spread out, right, I say, oh, God, if somebody's going to have a bad night, let it be Stephen. He's more spiritual than me. And uh, God answered my prayer. And uh, so, anyway, ramble, ramble. I'm pumped. I'm excited. You pray for David um, and uh, Natalie. And then Deb's got a Bible study with a young lady tomorrow night from, from tonight. You know, I mean, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We are to be teaching, 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 right? So, and uh, maybe it's one and done. But uh, maybe they'll give us two, three, four, five, and we'll see. Young man last night, young man last night, a lost young man. First time, first time last night. He, uh, I, I can't tell you all about it, but it's just good. It's just good. He, I think he's going to have a second one. Second one, right? So I make it sound like it's an enema. Um, but uh, it's good, it's good. So let's go to Lord in prayer. Enjoy, Lord. Um, Jeremiah 47, Jeremiah 47. How many read Jeremiah 47? I'm not impressed because it's only seven verses. And so um, 
I, next week when I say, how many of you have, have you read Jeremiah 48? Now that will be a test of stamina. And so uh, you'll be terrified that I might try to preach that all in one week. Uh, but um, tonight, the Philistines, the Philistines, let's pray. Father, I, I don't want to be such a flake that I'm excited. Father, I saw your hand tonight. This is a complex that, Father, we should reach. I'll be held accountable as a pastor. Our church will be held accountable for, for our Jerusalem. And this is a place that, Father, we've, I, I, we've struck out. And, and it's not your fault. It is, um, I think it was my lack of prayer and my lack of a dependence on you. And, and your people have prayed. And I thank you for a people that pray. I thank you for a people that care. Father, we need to be reminded all the time. Prayer is not some magic foo-foo dust. I don't want to treat it that way, Father. But, Father, it's us submitting to you and understanding nothing will be accomplished without you. And you bless tonight. And, Father, I do pray that you'll help us to reach the children, that um, you'll help the children understand the simplicity of the gospel. But Father, I pray you'll keep children from false professions, that um, they, would, they would not just um, do some act, but it would be faith, belief from the heart that only comes from you. Father, I pray that uh, you'll bless. Um, it's, it's a big deal, and, and I pray that we'll take it serious. I think, I think we are. I thank you for the good night tonight. I am, uh, I'm encouraged. Thank you for a smiling people and people that are tired. They've been up all day working hard, and, and I pray that you'll refresh their souls just with truth, and, and they're going to see that you're the same God from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And, and sometimes we view you differently in those first 4,000 years of history. And I think that's because we, um, we don't really give the breadth of your long-suffering and patience. Father, I pray tonight that you'd be glorified. You'd stir our hearts. That uh, Jesus would be our priority. Jesus would be our passion. That we would live for him and he would be the love and passion of our life, not in some weird romantic sense, but, Father, in a deep burning of our heart that there is one and only one that we live for, and that's you and your son. Father, bless this night. Thank you for a people that I can serve with. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's good to be with you this evening. Let's stand together and sing.
Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O ye earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall be strong, and my speech shall be filled as the sea, as the calm rain upon the tender earth, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, cry ye greatly. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. God is truth without iniquity. is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. God is truth without iniquity. Just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves. They taught not the father. And the children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. If you can see it up there, Lee. You can read. <coughs> they have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of the children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people, and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Has he not made thee and established thee? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Found him in a desert land, and in the waste howling wilderness, he led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wing, taketh them, beareth them on her wing, so the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. Go to the end of Deuteronomy 32. I suggest reading this whole thing because it applies to us. And the Lord spake unto Moses that same day, saying, Get thee up into this mountain, Abarim, and to Mount Debo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho. And behold, the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession. And die in the mount, whither thou goest up, and be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother died in the mount Or, and was gathered unto his people. Because ye trespass against me among the children of Israel at the waters of 
Merabah Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, because she sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. That thou shalt see the land before thee, but thou shalt not go thither to the land which I give the children of Israel. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.
Feeling blessed tonight. Look at that rain, man. I love it raining when we're in the building. And uh, God bless tonight. I am thankful. I was, uh, I'm just, I, we had a plan, and he was, he was so merciful and gracious and kind. And it is just good. So now, all those that went door knocking tonight, here's the plan for next week and the weeks to follow. So we're going to keep the teams the same. We might add some teams, so I need each of the teams to remember where you stopped, okay? And if you aren't sure what will be next, call me and we'll figure out what will be next for you. So Jacob and I, we're going to just stay that team. We know where we're at. We're going to pick it up from there. So Randall, you were with Ron. You, so we're going to keep those teams the same. You were with Afrandi. And so Deb, you know, so we're going to keep those teams and so then, boom, we're going to hit it a second time, third time. I would love for us to go through every door at Fairfield Point three times before Vacation Bible School. And, and what, what is very interesting is people are saying they're coming to church. People are saying they're coming to church. It's, you know, um, it's good. We got some Bible studies. God blessed, and it was, um, I don't think I was misinterpreting. You, we, would you agree we have not had good response from that apartment complex before? I mean, would you agree? It's just been cold, right? But the Lord was blessing tonight. This Saturday, this Saturday, 9 a.m. for the men, 9 a.m. for the men, Harbin Park, shelter number 11, Harbin Park, 9 a.m. We don't need to bring anything except a little hunger, a little humility. I need one more H. And, and hands. Hunger, humility, and hands, right? Hunger to eat. Humility going before the Lord, and then hands to throw a Frisbee golf. So that'll be this Saturday, 9 a.m. It'll be a great time. Invite, invite a friend. Invite um, a lost person. I will tell you, just hearing men pray is impactful. It is, it's good, and, and, it's, and I want you to experience what we experience on Tuesday mornings. It is a blessing. And um, I will tell you, if I wasn't the pastor, there'd be mornings I'd be like, pass. But I kind of feel like I, I probably shouldn't. And um, I love hearing these guys pray. And that's what we'll, we'll do on um, Saturday morning. We're going to have some good fellowship, good food. Thank you for Randall coordinating this. Thank you for Jesse for helping out too. And, and um, did Linda get a hold of you? Sounds like we're going to have a lot of orange juice. And so come ready to drink a lot of orange juice. I, I don't know where she got it, but um, we might, you know, <laughs> no, but it's, it'll be good. It'll be good. So um, we'll have a great time on Saturday morning. Man, 9 o'clock, Harbin Park. Shelter number 11. If you want me to send out an email, um, text me, and I can do that as well. Open your Bibles, open your Bibles. Jeremiah 47, Jeremiah 47. We're nearing the end of this pretty big book. It's a major prophet because of its size. And um, I will tell you, I've enjoyed it more than I thought I would. It's God's Word, and so I should always have a good spirit about it. I'm still not ready to preach Leviticus, and one day, one day in eternity, I will preach Leviticus if the Lord allows, but probably won't. Who, who would want, you know, if it's like, well, you get to listen to Jesus or Steve. Steve, you got zero votes. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> That'd be good, right? It'd be a waste of time listening to anybody else but Jesus. Let's read these seven verses here, and then we'll, a lot of background. I want you to see some maps, understand all of this perspective, because if you just read chapter 47, you might think God's a, an ogre. He's not. Who was it in our prayer? Somebody in our prayer on Tuesday. I thought it was good that uh, we view God as the monster and we're the monsters. We're the ones that have, uh, I mean, willfully and with a stiff neck broken God's law but he is a God of mercy. The one we've offended was the only one that could be our solution. Jeremiah 47 verse 1 says this, The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah, the prophet against the Philistines, before that Pharaoh smote Gaza. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, waters rise up out of the north, and shall be an overflowing flood, and shall overflow the land and all that is therein, the city and them that dwell there, therein, then the men shall cry, and all the inhabitants of the land shall howl. At the noise of the stamping of the hoofs of his strong horses, at the rushing of his chariots, 
and at the rumbling of his wheels. The fathers shall not look back to their children for feebleness of hands. Because of the day that cometh to spoil all the Philistines, and to cut off from Tyrus and Zidon every helper that remaineth. For the Lord will spoil the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Kaphtor. Baldness has come upon Gaza. Ashkelon is cut off with the remnant of their valley. How long wilt thou cut thyself? O thou sword of the Lord, how long will it be ere thou be quiet? I, I, let me just help you. I think verse 6, it's not clear, but I think this may be the Philistines crying out. How long until your sword will back off? But I think there's a lot of spiritual truth. And he says, Oh, thou sword of the Lord, how long will it be ere thou be quiet? How long until, until you stop, till you're quiet? Put up thyself into thy scabbard, rest, and be still. But then the response, how can it be quiet, the sword of the Lord? Seeing the Lord hath given a charge against Ashkelon and against the seashore, there hath he appointed it. Tell the message tonight, the Philistines, the thorn must be removed. Not that there's a thorn in this um, chapter here, but I say this because the Philistines had been a long time thorn in the side or thorn in the flesh of Israel. Let me just take you through a little history, a Bible history of the Philistines. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21. Just we'll walk through a few scriptures of the Philistines. Genesis 21, verse 33, this is um, Abraham. It said, it came to pass, excuse me, no, wrong verse. In Abraham, Genesis 21, verse 33, and Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. So this is roughly 2000 BC. So the first time the Philistines are mentioned, 2000 BC. By the time we get here in Jeremiah with this prophecy, ultimately that Babylon will come and destroy um, the Philistines, um, we're talking it is 1,400 years later. So obviously when, when um, Abraham had gone and he, he sojourned in the land of the Philistines, the Philistines had existed for some time. But at least in 2000 BC, first mention of the Philistines. Look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. The Philistines are mentioned again, and you'll remember this, many of you will, as God is taking them out of Egypt. If you remember Exodus chapter 12, there may be some chapters in your mind that trigger, you know, I, I, I have more triggers in the New Testament, but Exodus chapter 12 is a trigger for me because it's the, um, no, I'm going to let, it's, the uh, it's the Passover, instructions for the Passover, Exodus chapter 12, right? So Exodus 13, God, as they exit Egypt, look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. So the easiest place to go was through the land of the Philistines, for God said lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. God was merciful. He was kind. Is there an echo with this? If it's only me, then I'm fine. So there's not, I'm going to try to move it down just a little bit. It feels a little hot. That's better for me. Is you can still hear me okay? Okay. Um, it was just echoing in my own ears. I hate to hear my voice. And so, um, but Exodus 13, God was merciful and he was gracious to the Israelites. And we know this, they were kind of whiners and complainers Welcome to the party, you and I that are whiners and complainers, right? We, we need to be grateful and, and thankful to the Lord. But he, he kept them from going through the territory of the Philistines. And he, he did this. So we're talking, you know, roughly 600 years later after they were first mentioned at the time of Abraham. And so they are, um, God keeps them from that because the Philistines were warmongers. They were people that were just, they were, they were butcherous. They, they, were, they were somewhat brilliant in that they, they used steel ahead of their time when 
it would be called, you know, the time of the of use of iron. And so they had steel, they had equipment, and and they had blacksmiths, and and they could do things that others couldn't. But they were they were a people of war. I want you then to look at Joshua 13. Joshua 13. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Someone encouraged me recently. In their 60s, they memorized the books of the Bible. You should memorize the books of the Bible. That'd be a great place to start. Randall, I have printed 100 verses every Christian should know. I just need to fold and staple them, but they are sitting on my desk. So I'm one stage away from having them. I'll have them on your podium by this Sunday. 12 of them you need? Okay. I also have 100 verses every Christian should know. I made, I made 25 copies. If you don't have that and you want to memorize some scriptures that will help you in your witness and in your love, for the Lord and truth, it's by topic. It's, it's the best. I didn't create it. I just, when I see something good, it's not copyrighted, I will search and reapply and I'll steal it. And so um, it is, it's fantastic. You should use it as a tool to hide God's word in your heart. So freebie, Joshua chapter 13, Joshua chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. It says, now, Joshua was old and stricken in years. And the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years. The Lord's a straight shooter. <laughs> and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remaineth. So Joshua's about to die. And he was, he was a, a, a great man of God. He was, he was just one of these choice servants of the Lord. And, and, uh, but they hadn't conquered everything. And the, the Lord says, here's the land that remaineth. You see this first one. All the borders of the Philistines. And all Geshurai, from Sihor, which is before Egypt, even unto the borders of Ekron, northward, which is counted to the Canaanite, five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites and the Ashtothites and the Eshkelonites, the Gittites and the Ekronites and the Avites. You'll see many of the cities that are mentioned there. So Gaza, Ashdod, Ekron, um, they are cities. They're the, one of the, some of the five main cities of... of um, Philistia, or, or the Philistines, right? You'll hear it. Philistia would be the, the Hebrew word for it. And I want you to know this. So then um, the, uh, the Greek word for Philistia, you know what it is? Palestinia. So the, the root and origin of what they would call Palestine today is from the Philistines. And so uh, it's, it's really, it's Israel. So I, I still call it Israel. And so they, they didn't conquer all the land. And the sad thing is, and so John Yates of Faith Bible Institute is famous for this. Who was it that took over after Joshua died? Nobody. That was a great problem. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And you'll see the Philistines never got booted out of the land. And they were a thorn in the Lord's side. I, I want to take you just quickly because I want to just introduce and just reaffirm. Look to Psalm 44. Because there's this, there's this delicate balance in life that um, the reason why the Philistines were a thorn in the side of Israel for centuries was because Israel did not obey God. If you agree, say amen. Amen. I mean, that's, um, that's not a trick question. I know you, guys, you guys are like, oh, I'm a, you're wrong. <laughs> no, so I want to tell you this. That's true. But here's the, here's the reality, the balance of it is. So this is, this is just understanding God, right? And is that true? So let me, I, I would like a little bit more support. Ron's just one of my um, cronies that'll say amen, and even if he doesn't even know what I'm saying. No, no Ron, Ron's selective. He's selective. He doesn't amen and, uh, when he doesn't agree. I'm just kidding. So let me ask you this. The reason the Philistines were not removed from Canaan land, the promised land, is because Israel didn't obey God. Amen? Okay, that's true. All right, But now, this is the balance. I'm just taking here. This is a freebie. i got seven verses, so it's like maybe I, I have some more stuff I want to teach you. It's this. But here's what I want. I don't want us to be this way. Let me ask you this one other question. Does God bless obedience? 
Amen? Amen, he does, all right? But I want to help you with this. We should never brag about our obedience, should we? It's still the mercy and grace of God that blesses. I want you just to look at Psalm 44. This is the balance. I want you to be clear the reason the Philistines weren't removed from the land is Israel didn't obey. But it's simple obedience. Look at Psalm 44, verse 1. Psalm of David. He says, We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days, in the times of old, how thou didst drive out the heathen with thy hand and plantest them, how thou didst afflict the people, and cast them out. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them, but thy right hand, and thy, thine arm, and the light of thy countenance, because thou hast a favor unto them. That would be another word for grace. Thou art my king, O God, command deliverance, deliverances for Jacob. I, I take you here, because here's the balance. It's God that would have removed the Philistines, right? All he had to do, it was just like Jericho. Jericho is our lives. Do you understand that? Jericho was not just like, whoa, man, that would be really cool if that happened in my life. Jericho happens every time we just simply obey God. And when something good happens, we need to stop saying, I'm awesome. We need to look at God and say, he's awesome. You know all God wants to do? He says, March around the city once a day for six days. Okay. And on the seventh day, I want you to march around it seven times, and I want you to blow the trumpet, and I want you to shout. Seems kind of a little bit goofy, right? I mean, if you're a man, it's like, um, no. And the walls came down flat. I want you to know this. This is just this is to be an encouragement. You don't have to be Superman. You don't have to be Superwoman. Just obey. You know what Israel didn't do? They were afraid of the Philistines. And they were a formidable foe. They had impressive weaponry. Far advanced beyond their time. And they were ruthless. And that's part of the reason why we see Jeremiah 47 is God is judging them for them being a thorn in the side of Israel for centuries. But I want you to remember this. All Israel had to do was go in faith in God, and they would have their swords. But it's God's arm, it's God's strength that will defeat the enemy. I want you to remember that. All we are asked to do is obey. Can anyone in this room save anybody? No. But God said, obey. I want you to preach the gospel. I want you to teach my word. I want you to go, and I will bless. And so we got to be careful. If God blesses, let's make sure he gets all the glory, he gets all the credit, and, and it's just good, right? It's why I particularly like us praying more consciously and fervently and specifically for Vacation Bible School and for things we do, because I want us to make sure that we understand this. If something happens, it's because of God. All good things are from God. And I, I just tell you that because if only Israel had just obeyed, it would have been his strong arm that would have put a whooping on the Philistines, and they would have avoided all of this hassle for so, so long. I want to tell you that, you know, just remind you a few things. You know, some of the most Famous, if we'd had Sunday school, I could open it up. Some of the most famous, you know, skirmishes with the Philistines. You know, probably one of my favorites is Samson, right? Samson, man, he put a whooping on the Philistines, right? He didn't conquer them, but boy, they feared Samson. And, and God was glorified even in Samson's um, compromised um, obedience. Um, God was still honored. Probably the you know, there were seven key battles. I won't go through those tonight. Seven key battles, the scripture list, with the Philistines. And, and so um, probably the most famous battle would be David and Goliath. And after David put a stone in the middle of Goliath's forehead and he fell flat and chopped off his head and took his head through the city, Israel then, it is so awesome. One day, if you can go to um, Israel, I was in the valley. 
It's a little bit different than you're thinking. It wasn't a hill on this side and a hill on this side. It was a hill this way and a hill this way. And you see the valley. And you could, you, it, you know how it is with a valley, your voice does carry. Goliath's voice would carry. We probably were in the brook where David took the five stones. I think they load more stones in there because everybody brings five home. There's no way those are original stones because we're all like, it's from the time of David. No, it's from a stone quarry just down the road. Um, but, um, but it was probably the brook that David would have gotten the stones because it was right along that valley. Wasn't that just cool? It was just cool to envision Israelites hiding out. B5 Fofum, Goliath coming down in the valley. And then David, little squirt. See, David is Jericho all over again, isn't it? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. What did David do? He just obeyed. Watch us get to heaven and go, that's only the third time I ever threw a sling. And we're like, well, that guy was practicing every day. You know, I've kind of heard that. You know, it's every day. I'm, who knows how many, you know, scoundrels he, you know, he might have just said, no, God guided that rock. And I think that's, that's really what happened too, right? And he just obeyed. And then Israel, it, it emboldened them. And they, the men became men willing to, to stand up for God. And then God gave them the victory. It's probably the most famous of the, the skirmishes that they had. I, um, there's one more, but let me just show you. Let me show you a couple of, uh, I want to show you a couple of, um, a couple of, this one's a little, um, can you see that? You probably can't that well, can you? This one, so this is, would be Israel. This is kind of back in the day. This would have been the uh, northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. This would be the southern kingdom. And this is what would be called Philistia. Okay? And then we're going to talk in a couple weeks about Moab, and they're going to be judged by God, and, and the Ammonites are going to be judged by God. And over here is Egypt. So let me take you to a modern map. So this modern map's pretty cool. So you'll see here, you've heard of the Gaza Strip, right? Well, Gaza was one of the five cities of the Philistines, right? And Gaza, the Gaza Strip's right down here, and that's where, you know, if I do this and I do that right, you'll see here that the city of Gaza is right there, and guess what you see? That uh, Gaza, the Gaza Strip's right here, right? The West Bank, bigger than you thought, right? And so this light color is Israel, and then here's over here, what is that? Jordan, our friends from Jordan. And um, so we've got Lebanon up here. So Lebanon, when you see um, um, Tyre and Sidon, Tyre and Sidon were seaports up here, and they would not come to the rescue of the Philistines, right? So now what's interesting, let me, let me just help you see this, just a little background. Look at, look at chapter 47, verse 4. Look at chapter 47, verse 4. It talks about the judgment. It says, but of the day that cometh to spoil all the Philistines and to cut off from Tyrus and Zidon, Every helper that remaineth, for the Lord will spoil the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Kaftor. Well, the, the Hebrew name for Kaftor is Crete. So here's what's interesting. So you got here, this is Tel Aviv right here, modern day Tel Aviv. And, and uh, it's one of the most liberal cities in the world. It's crazy, right? Tel Aviv is, is dominated. You, you name a liberal issue and they are the leader of it. Well, about 600 miles west, in the Mediterranean Sea is Crete. You got Cyprus about right here. You got Crete about 600 miles away. So it was Crete today is, is, a, is an island that's part of uh, Greece. It's an island that's part of Greece. So the Philistines, apparently, that was their homeland, but they came here and, and they, um, they came here, and this would be what you'll see as Philistia. And they had a key, not only did they have, you know, um, the the Mediterranean Sea and some key seaports, but it was a main avenue of travel that it would made them wealthy, and they also took advantage of their power. But I just wanted to see this. I think this is always cool when you begin to see today's map versus yesteryear's map, and, and there is no remnant of, of the Philistines, though the word Palestine would be a, a derivation of that from the Greek word Palestinia that, that came from that as well. So um, one other thing, one other thing. I want, I want you to turn to 2 Kings, and then this is just background. 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18. This is one of the seven battles, and this is the last battle that the Bible mentions. And so um, this would have been a couple of, um, let me see, let me see. It would have been a couple hundred. Let me see, Hezekiah, Hezekiah. No, it wouldn't have been that long. It wouldn't have been, it would have been... Um, 
This is the last battle of the Philistines. I've got to, I've got to go back and get in my head straight what, what the date was. This would probably be less than 100 years before this prophecy. Maybe not 100. 2 Kings chapter 18, talking about Hezekiah. Hezekiah is just one of the great men of God, great kings, although he blew it this last 15 years. But look at uh, 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 5. The last battle that's recorded in the Bible of Israel and the Philistines, but it doesn't mean that the Philistines weren't a pain in the neck. It says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, Hezekiah, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. What a statement. For he clave to the Lord, oh, that this would be our description, and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. This guy loved the Lord and loved his son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah that was to come. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Syria and served him not. He smote the Philistines, even unto Gaza, the borders thereof, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. This, this nemesis, this enemy of Israel, Hezekiah, not only did he rebel, remember, remember the great story of Sennacherib and 185,000 um, soldiers were killed overnight by an angel of the Lord. And not only did he rebel against them and they mocked him, but he also then addressed this thorn that had been in the side. And the Lord recognizes that as well. So that gets us to Jeremiah 47. That background, we could have gone through all the battles. We could have gone through even, there's written history about the evil, about the, the butchery, about um, these, this, these, these men, particularly men because they were a warmongering nation, right? They, they had three gods. They had three gods that they were adopted from other um, civilizations as well. So Ashtoreth was was sort of the god of love, the god of war, and it just involved a lot of, um, of uh, sensual um, acts and things. They had, um, oh, let me see. I've got it written down. They had, uh, uh, we, we know the one, um, let's see if I can find it here real quick. So I've got them written down here, um, the three gods. And I had some stuff that was pretty cool that I can't find now. Uh, let me see. The three gods. Oh, um, I was going to talk about them later, but I'm going to talk about them now. Dagon, remember Dagon was fun when they, when they took the Ark of the Covenant. Dagon was the fish god. So, you know, they were, they were people of the sea, right? So fish were kind of important. So we need a god of the fish, right? So when they had the Ark of the Covenant, remember, then um, Dagon fell down. <laughs> they put him back up. Boom, his palms fell off, right? And, and they got emeralds. Look it up. It's kind of interesting. And um, so it's, it's just, uh, so Dagon was the, the fish god, and then, be Beelzebub. Beelzebub is, is um, the god of the flies, right? They, and so I want you to know this. When, when the Pharisees said, he serves Beelzebub, it was the same god. Understand this. They were saying it was the god of filth. Flies are filthy, but why would they have a god of the flies? You ever wondered that? It was because flies were known to carry nearly more disease than any other thing on earth. And they said, we need the God of the flies to protect us from the flies. Tonight, man, did we see more flies? I mean, whoa, I've never seen so many. I mean, Jacob's being kind. He's like beating them off me when I'm trying to talk to people, right? And uh, it was, we saw a lot of flies. But we don't need a God of the flies. We have the God of the universe, and we trust the Lord with all that. But they hated the flies. They knew they carried disease, so they had that as well. Now let's look at, I think I've got one, two, three, four, five, six things, six thoughts tonight, six thoughts tonight that I want you to see from this chapter. And I have given you a lot of background because I intended to. The reason why I want you to see that God is not um, quick to judge, long-suffering. First introduction we see in the Bible is 2000 B.C. We're talking now, this is about 600 B.C., 1,400 years later, and now it's just prophesied, and Babylon will come from the north and will destroy them. And we will not hear much from them anymore. But look at verse 2, if you'll see this when I say judgment will come as a flood. The Lord uses this. Look at verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, waters rise up out of the north, and the waters would, would represent, in this case, the overwhelming number of soldiers, 
and shall be an overflowing flood, and shall overflow the land and all that is therein, the city and them that dwell therein, and the men shall cry, and all the inhabitants of the land shall howl. I want you to know this. The flood and the flood of men that the Bible uses here, coming from the north, the flood has always been typically a um, source of judgment. We know the worldwide flood of Noah. Most people don't believe that, but I, I always ask people, I say, well, what's the highest mountain in the world? And um, this went blank. It is Mount Everest. Thank you. It's like, I don't know. Mount Everest, right? Do you know there's seashells on the top of Mount Everest? And I ask them, I'll say, how did they get those seashells up there? I said, can you believe that guys, when they're trying to climb Mount Everest, would take seashells up there to deposit them? And they're like, I didn't know that. I go, they didn't do that. I go, you know why there's seashells on the top of Mount Everest? Because the ocean covered Mount Everest at one time. I go, how in the world could the ocean cover Mount Everest? I said, the Bible tells us there was a worldwide flood and there's seashells everywhere. Why is it, is it the, uh, the, the, the uh, what is it, the brachiopod is the state thing, whatever you'd call it for Ohio? Isn't, is the state what? Trilobite? Okay, is that that's some kind of like sea, sea animal? Okay, so thank you for that. Whatever, you know, it, these people don't believe me because I could tell they didn't have a clue what I was talking about. But uh, the, the trilobite, the trilobite is, is a sea creature. And what is it, the state state fossil? It's the state fossil. Thank you for that. I was going to say, it's the state what? It's the, it's the state fossil because there's so many of them. Well, how'd they get here? In Ohio. We're, hey, we're all not like, going, we're going to the beach today. <laughs> the beach ain't near us. Okay, you guys are going, well, we're going to uh, whatever, Lake Erie or what's this thing over in uh, Indiana, Brookville Lake. And they have these fake beaches there, right? It's like, dud. But anyway, judgment will come as a flood. Judgment will come as a flood. And so he's telling them this, and I want you to understand this. When judgment comes, it is overwhelming. Second thing I want you to see, the warning will be heard. Look at this. God talks about this. Just pay attention. It says, and, and they, the inhabitants shall howl at the end of verse 2, at the noise of the stamping of the hoofs of the strong horses, at the rushing of his chariots and at the rumbling of his wheels, it talks about this, the warning will be heard. Are we listening? I want to tell you, I, I saw a headline today. When will we do something to make this stop? There was another shooting in Chicago on Monday night, July 4th. Terrible, tragic, awful. Those are our warnings from God. Will you look up? Will you repent? Will you realize that you have left me? You've departed from me. You've moved away from me. Do you see America when you leave me? Evil increases. But we blame God. Do you hear the warnings? Do you hear the warnings in your life? I want you to know this. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. How many of you have ever done post-sin analysis? You should. I've done it. I always see a door. I always see a way to escape. And you know what I love? God was faithful. I didn't have to sin. And you know this? There were many ways to escape. You know what I did? I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. God warns us. That's his loving warning. The noise of the chariots. Let me tell you what they should have done. They still should have looked up and repented and said, you know, even if I die today, please forgive me. The thief on the cross, I'll tell you this, he turned to the only one that could rescue him, and that's Jesus Christ. They, they heard the warnings, and they did nothing. What about you and I? I'm telling you, God's so good. God's so good. He is warning you. Are, are you pursuing sin tonight? I will tell you, God's been so good to you, you will see his warnings because all it's going to end up is it's going to destroy you. The Bible is so consistent. Life is so consistent. Will you listen? If your heart's going right now because you think nobody else knows, the only one that knows that matters is God. You'll never get away with it. Do you hear the warnings? That's the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God. You know, I'm telling you, the most important thing that we, we have is not life here on earth, but it's, it's our souls. When they heard the, the horses, the, the hoofs, and 
they heard the chariots and they heard the wheels, they should have, they should have repented and turned to God. Third thing I want you to see, friends will abandon them. You'll find out who your friends are, and there's really not that many. I tell people all the time, try not to turn your back on family. It's probably all you have. I know, family, we can be absolute jerks, can we not? And I'm at the head of the line. I will tell you, fight and do everything you can. Do not let things get in between your family. You keep loving, you keep reaching them. I'm just telling you this because the people that you think are your friends, when the going gets tough, they're gone. I'm just, I'm just telling you, friends. But look at where I get that is verse 4. Look at verse 4. He says, Because of the day that cometh the spoil, to spoil all the Philistines and to cut off from Tyrus and Zidon every helper that remaineth. It's this. Tyrus and Zidon, they were probably um, very, very much in... Um, in uh, Cahoots is the word, but what would it be? It would be partnership would be a better word. They, <laughs> cahoots, right? Uh, they were very much in partnership with, with uh, the, the port cities in Philistia. So Tyre and Zidon would have the north covered. They're in modern-day Lebanon. And then Philistia would have the south covered, and they would work together. But the Bible says that Tyre and Zidon, they will be cut off, and they won't help you. I, I want you to understand this is, do you know God? Or is he just your 911 emergency call? Does he know you when you talk to him? I remember the time I, I called now my wife for 34 years, and I called her to ask her out. I had to say, I had to say my last name, number one. Then I had to associate myself with my sister. That was rough for me. Hey, this is Steve Hall, <coughs> Tina's brother. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, because I had to let her know who I was. Does God know who you are? Or do you just show up when you need something? See, I, I love Jesus. I talk about it often, and I'm challenged by it. When I have a free moment, do I run to the feet of the Father? Jesus did. Not because he needed anything, because he loved being in the presence of his Father. You know, even Elia, she's just funny, right? I just, I'm just, I'm just, I, I had an awesome weekend, right? Because she likes me. That's probably a big reason too, right? But Elia's always like this. And she's only eight months old. She's like, hey, down here. You guys aren't paying attention. She, you know, eight months old, she's like, whoa, are you guys talking about something other than me? We have a problem. And so it's just funny, you know, she's like, right here. Right here. Yeah, there we go. There we go. All right. I got you. And I mean, I delight in it. I don't get to see her enough, but it is, um, she, she wants to be the center of attention. So do you, so do I, so do you. We got to fight that, don't we? You know, it's, it's, it can be difficult, right? It, as a preacher, in essence, I'm the center of attention and I'm the communicator for this. But boy, I'll tell you this, if I begin to get puffed up with that. I am useless. I will destroy myself, and I will steal the glory from God. That's wrong. It's why I mean that. I'm not interested in your compliments. I want to be used of God, but I don't want to be full of myself. You pray for that. If you think I'm full of myself, you ask God to help me. I don't want to be full of myself. I don't. We all struggle with pride, right? I want to, I want to deliver the word of God. I want to be used of God, but I want to make sure I always remember it's about him and not me. Fourth thing I want you to see is false gods cannot help. Look at this. This is in verse 5. Baldness has come upon Gaza. If you are bald tonight, <laughs> I just, Ron looks up. And uh, no, you know, but you are the only one that is truly Gaza esque. <laughs> but no, baldness was in history, you'll see this, it was a. It was a symbol of humility, right? And um, the men at this time, they would shave their heads bald in order to try to bring sympathy from their false gods. And so they, they would fight, but they would realize this. When Babylon came in, there was no fight that would overcome Babylon, and so they would shave their heads. But you see this at the end? And it says, how long will thou cut thyself? You see, they were, they were cutting themselves. And we saw that when, when um, 
Elijah was at the top of Mount Carmel, and the 400 prophets of Baal, he said, hey, you set up a, you guys, you set up a, a sacrifice, an altar. You go first. And the, the altar, that fire comes down from heaven, then that's the one true God. And the 400 prophets of Baal, they, good. Obviously, I think the prophets of Baal, they weren't as foolish as you think. They had seen the power of, of the devil. But you see, God would keep anything from happening that he doesn't want to happen, right? And so um, what did the prophets of Baal do? They began to cut themselves. And the Bible says, what's in 1 Kings 18? It says that blood began to gush. And they thought it would bring sympathy. <laughs> You've got to love Elijah, right? I don't know. I probably shouldn't love this part. But when he's like, maybe he's asleep. Maybe he is traveling afar and he can't hear you. And so he mocked them. I've got to be careful because I, I think the Lord would prefer me not to do that. Don't like it. <laughs> got to be careful. Because just because the Bible says it doesn't mean it's right. But he knew his God would deliver. I want you to know this. It's, it's superstition. I want you to have the confidence in God. Just confidence in God. I'm okay if you have no confidence in yourself. But will you obey? See, if your lack of confidence leads you not to obey, then that's the sin. But don't, I don't care if you have confidence in yourself. Have confidence in the only one that matters, and that's God. When God says it, let's do it. And when something comes into our life, let's trust in the Lord. And let's, let's examine our hearts. Maybe this is chastisement from the Lord. Maybe it's just a time to honor and glorify Him. But let's not turn to anyone but God. It's important. What do you turn to? What do you turn to when the going gets tough? I've always wondered about this. I've always thought, you know, why do I think this? I've always thought, what if I'm in a head, head-on accident? What would my last words be? Would they be crying out to God? I hope so. I think I've talked this recently. And... Uh, I think I, I asked you guys before, you know, if, I'm, if a plane's going to go down. If I have to die, I'd prefer to go down on a plane. No doubt about it. It'll, it'll just result in great benefit for my family behind. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if I really want to know about it. You know, we have three hours and seven minutes before we're going to die. Just wanted you to know. That, that might be a little bit too long for me. Um, but it is, um, I've always envisioned this. I thought, would I? I pray I would. Would I have enough, enough trust in God that if he put me on that plane, he wants me to share the gospel? Not by my power, just to share the gospel. Are you ready to die? If you died in three hours and six minutes, where would you be to share the gospel? I don't know. I don't know what I would do, but who will I turn to in time of need? I will tell you, I've, I've, heard, I've heard the conversations. It's interesting. My life's a little bit simple. You know, it's just me and my wife. And, and so this, uh, the inflation, I, I, don't, I don't feel the effects as much as you do. I, I, I pretty much just, you know, drive locally. And so, and we're not buying tons of food, right? And so, um, but I, 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 I tell you what, I hear it from you guys. You're feeling it. It's real. You're feeling the pinch. Who are you going to trust in? You're going to trust in God? call ourselves Hope Baptist Church because I was expecting these times to come way sooner, and I don't think we've seen anything yet. I want us to ask the Lord. These are just, these are just um, tremors. Ask the Lord to help you, but it's real. God cares. You know this? I, I love this. We prayed. I was with a family recently, and they said, would you pray about it? And they, they, were little, they were a little gun shy about it, but I said, God cares about that. I said, oh, God, help them. Help them with these the times that their, their finances are tight, they're struggling, oh, God, help them. God cares about those things. You can take those things to him. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God cares. It's more real than I've ever seen in my church life in my life. I was too young in the 70s, and it was real then. Interest rates, right? My, remember, my parents got a house for 14%, and they were giddy about it. They're like, woo, got over 14. I should have heart attacks if you got 14%. And 
And they were happy about it back in the day. Final thing is the response to the sword of the Lord. Look at the response. And, oh, thou sword of the Lord, I, I think, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I think, and I'm not the only one to think this, I think this would be the cry from the Philistines. Oh, thou sword of the Lord, as he brings judgment. How long will it be ere thou be quiet? How long until you're quiet? Put up thyself into thy scabbard, rest and be still. They were only interested in escape, not turning from their sins. Real quickly, I've only got a couple minutes, turn to Revelation chapter 6. This mirrors what I think is happening here in the judgment of Philistia, the Philistines. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 and 17. Revelation 6 is, is a shocking with the judgment of God and, and the horses and the devastation that occurs. And Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 says this, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every freeman, so everybody from top to bottom, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. I mean, judgment was coming. They just hid. And they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us! And hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Rather than, oh God, please forgive me. Oh God, you're the one that I've sinned against. Oh God, we deserve this judgment. I want you to understand this. Let's get right with God. He's not an ogre. He's long-suffering. I, I believe my life is a picture of God's long-suffering, his patience. I'm, I'm, I need to be more thankful. I need to do what's right. Final thought, just with this, the response to the sword of the Lord. Are you glad when God's word cuts to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and highlights for you? You know what our average response is? If, if, I, if I came up to, to Liz and I said, you know, you have this problem. And you would be like, your first response would be like, oh, that's bold. And your first response would be probably be like, you don't know me. Um, no, I disagree. You know, that'd be a normal response, right? I mean, but um, it, especially as it's within marriage, right? It's this. Set that aside. What about when the, when the Bible cuts? How will you and I respond? When the Lord... <laughs> okay. How will you and I respond? Will we just limp out the door? Rather be dead than obey? Or will we listen we just respond and say, oh, will you stop? Will you stop? Will you stop? Or will we know our God is so good and you say, oh, Lord, if there's other things, please cut and remove. You see, God, all of his instruction is for our good. Yes, it's for his glory, but it's for our good. When the Bible cuts, let's respond with a yielding in a humble spirit before the Lord. Let's not be like the resistant Philistines. We'll see that in the Moabites. We'll see it in the Ammonites. Let's listen to God. Let's pray. Father, your people are, they are faithful. And I believe, Father, I, I love their spirit. I think they've come to hear from you. Would you speak to our hearts? Would you just remind us that, Father, you are amazing. It was over 1,400 years before final destruction came on this nation, that, Father, above most nations, they were surrounded by the truth of you. They weren't some distant nation. They were in the backyard of the Israelites. They knew of you. They knew Samson. They knew Jephthah. They knew Shamgar. They knew David. They knew the God of Israel. They rejected you, but your long-suffering was so patient. Father, I pray we'll see that, and that we will see you as a trustworthy God. Father, I pray that you'll heal the one that's the most discouraged in our room. And may they just see this. All I need to do is obey. I don't need to do something spectacular just the next step. And you're the God of the spectacular. We don't have to be. Just obey, and you're the one that gives the victory. May we have that simple faith. May we just simply trust and obey. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions, you see me. You're dismissed.